The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let me uh, begin by giving you a little bit of a preview of what's coming up over the next couple of weeks in terms of the calendar. Uh, to the problem set that's due today, you, you'll notice, is perhaps a little bit long. But the good news is the next problem set you'll look at and go, is that all? Because it will look very short. Part of the reason is the problem set that goes out today will be due a week from today, next Tuesday. But a week from Thursday will be our first quiz. So the upcoming problem set is meant to give you some time to go back and reintegrate and redigest uh, the material that we've covered so far. The material that is on this problem set that's going out, it's going to be a couple more, a few more problems uh, still related to control charting, some of the things we'll talk about today. And that will be covered on the quiz. So the quiz will be statistical basi basics up through uh, uh, statistical process control and control charting. That'll be a week from Thursday. This Thursday, I'll be giving uh, a lecture that shifts a little bit to yield modeling, and that will not be on either the problem, this problem set or this quiz. Okay, so uh, that's the plan. Uh, we'll have more details on the quiz, and I, I think even some example uh, quizzes that you can look at uh, uh, from the past. But uh, other quick warnings or, or previews on, on the quiz itself is uh, the plan is to make that closed book, but you will be able to bring a page of notes in so you can have a, a single page of cheat sheet or notes, uh, formulas, examples, whatever you can fit for quiz one on the one side of one page, uh, and also bring a calculator. Uh, we will provide for you any uh, statistics tables that might be needed, uh, typically out of the back of Montgomery or uh, May and Spanos. So we'll have those if you need them. Yes? So um, all the formulas for all the confidence intervals are not given them. We're not giving you those. So th those should go on your, on your one page of notes that you can bring in. Or you can just remember them if you're really good. <laughs> We'll give you a Z table. We'll give you a, a, a if you need it, T, chi squared. Uh, we'll give you those tables. Is there a gamma table? I'm sure there is a gamma table. I'm not sure whether or not it's in the. Uh, there were references to gamma of something or something. Yeah, it arises in. And that might be a clue. If you don't have a gamma table, don't try to use the gamma. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll try to try to dig up uh, an example, an example exam, so you can take a look. Okay. So, any questions? Other questions on the quiz? Any questions uh, from Singapore on the upcoming quiz? You guys look so eager for it. <laughs> okay. So today what I want to do is pick up a little bit where uh, Dave Hart uh, left off. So the plan here today will be very brief uh, review on control charting. The basic idea I want to be able to hit now that you've seen what he described and what you've been doing, hopefully, on the problem set that's due at the end of the day, is, is reinforce the relationship here between uh, hypothesis tests and, and control chart. And so I'm going to uh, just remind us a little bit about hypothesis tests and these different types of errors, the probability of false alarm, probability of a misalarm, missed alarm or, or, or beta, and how the sample size plays with that. Because when you design control charts, alpha, recall, basically sets your upper control limits and lower control limits. Beta falls out. It, beta being uh, related to essentially the probability, again, of missing an alarm when the process has, in fact, shifted 
And how do you change or affect beta? By modifying the sample size. So I want to talk a little bit about those. I think you might have touched on them uh, briefly, but I want to touch on those and also uh, remind us of the definition or give you the definition of average run length. And I think you've, if you've uh, gotten to that point in the problem set, you've already read about that uh, as well. So let me start again with the basic hypothesis test because remember all that a control chart is is a running hypothesis test where every new sample comes in, you're doing a hypothesis or you're asking the test on the hypothesis, has the pro process shifted or is it still my nominal distribution? So the basic, basic situation with the hypothesis test, if you recall, what we have is our assumed distribution. And I'm going to assume here that it's a, it's a Gaussian. We'll call that H naught. It's got some mu, some true process mean. And what we said is we pick control limits, or in the hypothesis test case, acceptance regions. But, but I'm going to sort of use the control chart terminology since that's what we're dealing with here. We pick where these limits are based on a probability of false alarm. Seems a little weird, right? But basically what we do is we assign, if alpha is our false alarm rate, we put alpha over 2 in each of the two tails. Now that's based on this key idea that if we're in, in control, most of the time the data will be in here. Every now and then, just by random chance alone, even when nothing has changed, we're still in H0, I do get an unusual point out in the tails. And if we do three sigma, we saw that's about three uh, in a thousand points will fall way outside in the tails. So when we get a point out in the tail, we say, hmm, something might be unusual going on. Either something has changed in the process or I got unlucky and I just pulled a sample from the tails. So in fact, there is, in a process that's always in control, there is this false alarm rate. Now another way of talking about this false alarm rate is also the inverse of the false alarm rate, which is how many runs does it take on average before you get a false alarm? And this is referred to as the <coughs> average run length. Okay, so here, sl sliding back to the to the uh, to the slides, can we put uh, can we put the PowerPoint slides on both screens? Great, thank you very much. Um, so looking back here, this is our our nominal probability again, three out of a thousand. But now if I turn it around and ask the question, how often or what is the average number of runs that we have to go? Well, it's just one over that probability on any one run of uh, having the point fall in the tails. Okay, So that's the definition of our average run length. And actually, a notation that I like in Montgomery is we'll define this as average run length sub zero. And what that does is remind me that that's the average run length associated with the H naught, the default probability distribution. Okay. So that's the alpha part. Where does beta come in? Beta comes in when we actually have a shift. So the whole idea is now imagine that I've got a shift in the distribution, I've had a shift from mu to mu plus some uh, delta, right? I'm going to label that the alternative hypothesis. So the idea is for a given delta, I'm now actually drawing parts from a different distribution, my H1 distribution. I've already defined the acceptance region based on my acceptable average run length or my acceptable false alarm rate. 
By the way, there's nothing magic about plus minus three sigma. If you don't want to respond once out of, you know, three, th three times out of every thousand, or about once every 333 runs, you don't want to respond to a false alarm rate. It doesn't cost you that much to have a false alarm. Uh, or, or it costs a, a lot to have a false alarm, but it doesn't cost you that much to have a bad part. Then maybe you only want to respond one-tenth as, as much, in which case you would change your control limits, move them out a little bit so that uh, you set it based on the average, you know, set based on the uh, average run length or the probability that you can accept out in the tail. So that's set. But now we said there is also the type 2 error, or the beta error, which is the probability of a missed, a missed alarm. And that's set by those control limits, right? So now the probability that I would have thought it was a good part, even though an alarm occurred, is just the other side of that same control limit, but now drawn from the uh, H1 distribution. I really have a shift, but the point fell on this part of the tail of the H1 distribution, and I declared it good. I said there's no alarm. Okay? And we saw last time, basically, or a couple, a couple of classes ago, this is also, it's just the tail there in that distribution. It's uh, UCL uh, minus delta over sigma over square root of n. By the way, this is just this part of the tail. To be really careful, I should also subtract off eh, this tail, this <coughs> part right there, because if I got something way out there, I would call it a failed part. And so my beta is slightly smaller than this. But as I've drawn it here, I'm really only worried about this part of the tail. But there is the other part, a, a phi lower control limit plus delta minus, uh, excuse me, it's still a lower control limit, still minus uh, delta over sigma over root n. OK, great. There is also another definition of average run length associated with this. And the question you would pose here is what is the average run length to detect shift when it actually occurred? It's a little tricky here because there's actually two steps. You can imagine this would be the probability of not missing an alarm and then inverting it just like we did here. Right? So this, is the, this little tail here is the probability of missing alarm. There is also a definition referred to as the power of a test, which is 1 minus beta. And that's basically the probability of catching an alarm on any one run. And that's just, it's everything to the right of this. So now if, if uh, I draw from H1 but not in the region where I would have declared it H0, that's 1 minus beta. And average run length sub 1 is defined as 1 over 1 minus beta. So this is the average number of runs it takes to detect the shift, assuming it actually occurred. OK, everybody happy with this so far? Is it starting to all fit together? Now, how do I change? Well, why would I change alpha? I change alpha based on a, a decision outside on acceptance of uh, my acceptability of, of making a false alarm. How do I change beta? What if I say, it's taking me too long to detect a shift. I want it to take less time. Change, change n. So what, what changes when I change n? Does alpha change when I change n? No. 
right? Alpha is set a priori based on my false alarm rate. When I change beta, I, or when I change n, I do change beta. Do I change the control limits? I do change the control limits. I change the control limits because my sample size changed and I move them to maintain the same alpha. So let me draw the picture. Right. Let's see. If I draw it down here, can people in Singapore still see this? Okay, great. So, so if I increase n, what's going to happen is my, I have a sample size that tightens by my sampling distribution for, for x bar. Remember, h naught is really an x bar based on and so that distribution will have the same mean, but it'll get tighter. So now I have an H naught, but I'm still setting my control limits based on an acceptable alpha. But the control limits will get tighter because I've, I've got a tighter distribution. I still have the same alpha in the tail. And what's cool here is I'm still detecting the same mean shift so trying to draw it down here, boom, boom, boom. So now I've got a tighter distribution here as well. Here's my H1. I've got a tighter distribution on H1, and I've still got just a little bit of tiny stuff over here in the tail. And that's now my beta, and it's much smaller if I've increased N. Right? So I can basically pick my sample size to give me the acceptable false or the acceptable missed alarm rate or the acceptable average run length to detect the shift. And there are tables in uh, both Montgomery and May and Spanos that are uh, referred to as uh, operating curves or OCs that basically give you the relationship <coughs> between sample size, size of size of shift, and the beta or average run length one that you can uh, accept. You could go in and calculate them. Turns out this is actually uh, a really nasty calculation to do uh, because there's no closed for, you're, you're, if you need to find the end to give you a certain beta, you have to solve it iteratively. There's no closed form for that Q sum or the, uh, not, uh, the cumulative uh, probability that's associated with beta. Right? So it, it's, uh, there's no formula for it. And these tables have basically, or charts, have basically uh, uh, you know, calculated that for you. You can set up Excel or whatever to do that, to solve it iteratively if you want. But, yeah? You said that when we uh, change the size of n, beta changes, but alpha doesn't. But if the distribution is getting tighter, shouldn't alpha change as well? So, so the question was, we're changing alpha, or changing sample size. The distribution gets tighter. Why doesn't, uh, why? Yeah, why doesn't alpha? Why doesn't alpha change? If we kept the same lower control limit and upper control limit, and I tightened this, so if I kept these the same but the distribution tightened, then alpha would change. What's, what's interesting about classic control chart design is the upper control limit and lower control limit are based on the statistics. So they are based on alpha. We nail down alpha first and then set the upper and lower control limits. And there's a really important thing that we'll get to actually in just a second about process capability where then we tar start talking about upper and lower spec limits, which is related to the notion of where the parts uh, property really needs to be for it to function correctly. And those are very different than control limits, but often confused. And so no nominally, your, your spec limits wouldn't actually change if you're changing sample size, right? Uh, the part still needs to be to function correctly within a certain um, uh, band. Okay, so in that case, you change sample size. Your spec limits would not, but 
what people often do is erroneously set the control limits to equal the spec limits. And that's wrong. What you want to do is set the control limits based purely on the statistics based on a, your false alarm rate. Chance of observing by chance, or, uh, uh, by, by random probability, an unusual event. Follow up? Um, I guess I don't want to say too much about the, 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 the problem set right now, but the, you, can, you can often relate things back to the underlying probabilities, and what you should usually do is relate them back to the underlying probabilities and set up the hypothesis test based on shifts, uh, questions about, uh, you know, there can be two-sided shifts, one-sided shifts, um, both things could shift by a certain amount and you might be just worried about what's happening in the tail. Uh, there's other hypotheses. These are all for changes in the mean, right? If I'm looking at some other distribution, like changes in the variance, I could set up a similar hypothesis test and perhaps other probability distributions apply. Uh, it turns out with the S chart, we're really tracking the mean of standard deviation or the mean of the sample standard deviation. And in those cases, we typically still are assuming that the distribution of standard deviation for large samples is Gaussian with then correction factors to make it come close in setting the control limits, right? Those things like C4s and those, those sorts of things. <coughs> but, but going back, um, it's not always exactly the same setup, but you can almost always reason it out by going back and setting up what is my normal situation, what is the thing I'm trying to detect, and then look at the probabilities associated with those cases. Uh, I, I have a question for Yes. Peter. Question. Um, if I give you a control chart, you can't really tell uh, whether it's, it's a false alarm or it's a true alarm. Can you? Because That's correct. I mean, I mean, so I would just, like how you use a control chart then? Because if I give a control chart, it could be uh, with alpha probability of a false alarm or with uh, one minus beta probability of a true alarm. Right. So this, I can tell. yeah, I'm, this this is a, a fundamental uh, important point about how control charting works, which goes back to the idea that if nothing changes, you do have false alarms, and if something changes, you've got a real alarm. All you've got on the control chart is a point that's lying outside of your normal bounds. All by itself from the control chart, you can't tell. You are exactly right. So in SPC methodology, what you are supposed to do anytime you see an alarm is go and look at the equipment, investigate the problem, and decide, was this a false alarm? In other words, is the process still operating normally? Or has something important changed? Now it turns out that in an awful lot of factories, people have adapted or, uh, uh, to this notion of false alarm in a very qualitative way, which is they see one alarm point, they look at it, they don't investigate the process, they ignore it. And then they wait, they do the next point. If it's also an alarm, then they say, ah, I think something may really be wrong, and then they investigate. What are they doing there? How could you change a control chart to actually do what they are doing? What essentially they're doing is saying, I don't believe the evidence, the three in 1,000 chance of seeing one point outside of a control limits is not a strong enough evidence for me. What, I, what they're really doing is looking for a smaller probability of two points in a row uh, being outside of the control chart as much stronger evidence. So in this case, you know, roughly it's 
uh, twice as infrequent, or, uh, or not twice, but the product, right? The probability of seeing both of those points outside of the control limit, and, and again, not alarming on the first one, is the square of that. So that's a very infrequent thing. Then they say, I think there's really something wrong. Now, you could actually have adapted your control chart, either by having it only signal alarms once you've got two, two alarm points, or changing the control limits so that you basically move the control limits out even further so you've got to really have an alpha over two that's that small. So maybe you go to four, plus or minus four sigma, or 4.5 sigma, something like that, in order to to have that, that much, uh, that much evidence. And then what's, what steps are existing to find the sigma? I'm sorry? Well, well, oh, what steps? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge machine, and everything can be somehow changed. I don't know where I should start. Well, I think, I think the steps that you use to actually investigate depend completely on the process. But there's a few rules of thumb. And many of you have probably had actual process experience on different tools, different uh, manufacturing lines. What are some things that you would do? I'll tell you the number one thing I would do. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. <laughs> Pull the power plug. Plug it back in. No. I would, yes. Yes. That's exactly what I would do. I would always doubt my measurement equipment first. They also have failures. Rather than pull the process, you know, turn the process off and panic, with the actual equipment, I want to verify the measurement first. So I take it off, do, a, do an independent measurement uh, of those parts and try to understand it. So let's say that indeed I, I, I see, yes, that part looks like it's outside of the control limits. What's another thing you might do? Do you look just at that one single point? What other data do you have? Exactly. So now you can look back at the control chart data that has been plotted either manually in old systems or uh, uh, in, in the computer system. Track back historically and start to look, is there some other evidence that wasn't triggering an alarm, but that might give you a, give you a sense. And a, a telltale one might be, in fact, a slow drift in the points. Now, some people might set up the WECO rules, the Western Electric rules, to also watch for drifts. But that's pretty rare, frankly. People tend to just use the, the, the upper and lower control limits um, and a single point outside of them. So you might look back uh, at the rest of the data and try to see, is there any additional evidence? So trends can be incorporated in the control chart as well. Exactly. So we could also have, the, 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 the point was, trends could be incorporated in the control chart as well, either with this and additional rules or, in fact, other control charting approaches we'll talk about later uh, that are designed to track very or detect very subtle trends. Um, but again, the point would be often you are trying to debug the process and look back, so you are a good pattern detector, <laughs> and, and you, might, you might detect, uh, detect a pattern. Um, failing that, I think then you start looking uh, around to see if maybe there's not a systematic trend. What you're tr hypothesizing, in fact, is that there was a shift, not a trend. And you start talking to people, looking at the equipment, look, talking with the operators, and ask, did something unusual happen? The whole idea is you've detected an unusual event. Might that be correlated with? something else in the operation of the machine changing. So you start investigating and looking for things that, that might explain, explain a shift. So you go to talk to the operator, and it's a new operator. You've never seen that operator before. Mm -hmm. You say, when did you start? They say, an hour ago. <laughs> you know, aha. Um, and then it gets progressively more complicated. Right? You're going to have to dive into more details on either the process, the feedstock, all of those sources of variability that we talked about earlier. Good questions. Okay. So uh, I've sort of 
flown by these. These are actually slides, again, that were pulled out of last uh, uh, Thursday's lecture. But just illustrate this notion of, and give, give some example numbers, of uh, exactly what we're talking about here with average run length. The example plotted here is the same chart but drawn a little bit differently for kind of smaller shifts. Here we have a delta U that, that, uh, that, that moves the probability under the assumption of a shift. And this PE down here is basically 1 minus beta. So this is the probability of detecting the true shift uh, under the control limits, again, that were set based on H naught. And so here's an example where, again, the false alarm rate was 3 out of 1,000. With this small 1 sigma shift, now your tail probability there only becomes 24 out of 1,000 or an average run length, if I invert that, of about 42 samples are required before you can detect that small one sigma shift. Now, a one sigma shift doesn't seem all that small to me, right? If that's too long to detect a shift, then what do you do? Increase, increase sample size. That's exactly right. So, and the, here's simply the definition. What's going on there if we increase the sample size is the, the standard deviation, again, of our charts, our X bar chart, H naught and H1, uh, are shrinking. Okay? That moves our three sigma uh, limits closer together uh, so that you get smaller probabilities. Yeah? <laughs> yes, and so so the question was, to increase n, you've got to take more samples. So there is a, a little bit of this two-level hierarchy in sampling assumed here when I'm talking about this. We'll also talk about ways to um, deal with more continuously sampled, even driving n smaller, not larger, so that you can improve detectability. Uh, but, but the two-level two hierarchy that I'm talking about here is basically this notion that, you know, in, in, in many lines you've got lots and lots of parts coming off very, very quickly. So in time, you've got parts coming very rapidly. And the basic picture here is you're grabbing a sample of size n at some point in time. Maybe it's a four-point four sample. And then much later, I'm grabbing another four. So I am sampling from a much, what's pictured as a much larger group. And so the idea here is um, I actually have more than one degree of freedom. We've been talking about I can change just the sample size, but I might still, in time, only be sampling uh, I could have actually the same time period. So I'm not actually changing, if I, if I just modify my sample size here, I might actually not change the frequency at which I draw my size in sample. I might do this once an hour, and each time, and it, once every hour I draw a sample of size 4. Okay? So there's an additional degree of freedom that's not kind of in here, which is I could also shorten my, my sample time, if you will, right? Because then I get, it takes fewer minutes of clock time to get to my 42, my 42 runs that I sample. So I haven't really, really talked about sort of the trade-off between these two. But this is the assumed model. Now you could also do things, and I think what was kind of implicit in your, your question, is I could continuously sample everything. And these days of automated inspection equipment on the equipment, on the, on the manufacturing equipment, you're very often sampling and measuring virtually every part, in which case, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like every, every part gets measured, in which case I have a very interesting trade-off between 
between n, which is exactly the point you were making, if I increase n, then it, it takes me longer to get more runs that, it would each, that would form each point on the control chart. So there is a little bit of a trade-off there. Is that clear? Almost? Because uh, why you don't simply uh, increase, because the uh, upper control limit uh, is mu plus the sigma over root n. So why you just don't increase the coefficient? So instead of 3, just make it 5. So it's more sensitive to any change. Why you should increase the n? Uh, well, let's see. If you increase, go from 3 sigma to 5 sigma, you increase the control limits and you make it less sensitive. You have to have even more extremal points. So in that case, you've, you've increased, you decrease the sensitivity of the chart to false alarms. So, so in that case, you would want to... See, so alpha and beta are different. And when you play with them a little bit on the, on the, on the problem set, It'll reinforce, I think, a little bit of this. Okay. So again, this is basically the example we just we just talked about. Okay. So I want to shift to kind of this point that I was making earlier about the difference between control limits and spec limits. But I'm going to get to it through this notion of process capability. And uh, CP and CPK, if, if some of you have run into that or played with that yet on the problem set. And the point here is that once we've got a distribution like this, we've act based on historical data that we use to build our control chart, we basically have a model of our process, right? It's a very simple statistical model that says it has a particular mean and it has a particular variance in the normal distribution case. And an important thing that we can do with that model is answer a couple of key questions that really come up a lot, like how good is the process? Is the mean where we want it? Is the variance where we want it? Right? And in particular, how good is it with respect to our requirements for manufacturing a particular part or product? Okay? This is the notion of process capability. And what this also pulls in, then, for the first time, <coughs> unlike all of this, which is just probabilities on uh, a normally operating or a not normally operating process, process capability pulls in, for the first time, the notion of design specifications, different than control limits, OK? So the basic way to characterize your process is you have to Assure yourself that the process is indeed in control. Right? It's no operating normally, no common cause uh, events. When that's the case for a, a normally distributed process, it's characterized entirely by mean and variance or on our control chart by X bar and S. So indeed, if the control limits have been set correctly in relation to known uh, sample sizes, and known probabilities of error and so on, then X bar and S tells you everything about the underlying process mean and variance, right? And now we can start to use those to look at where the process sits and those statistics sit with respect to uh, tolerances or quality loss functions. Quality loss functions may be a little less familiar to you. Everybody has an intuitive idea of a tolerance. So let's talk about that first. Basic idea of a tolerance on, say, a part measurement is that there is an upper and lower limit. So let's say it's some characteristic dimension. We have a nominal dimension or a target dimension. We'll label that X star. And then we have an upper spec limit and a lower spec limit that we simply say, as long as the part is, dimension is within those that range, we're going to call it a good part, and it meets maybe the design requirements, it meets our consumer's requirements, uh, what have you. And what we're saying is, in essence, anything anywhere within those spec limits is equally good and equally shippable. Right? So there's no notion of better or worse. It's simply <coughs> on-off decision. It's acceptable or not. Okay? So that's a spec limit or not. 
Now, the idea of a quality loss function is a beautiful idea that actually conforms a little bit better to what we really care about. And one could think of a quality loss function as this penalty function for any deviation away from our target x star. Okay? Now, graphically, a typical quality loss function that is used is a quadratic cost for these deviations, okay? Where um, the further I get away from x bar, I penalize more and more, not just even in a linear fashion, but in a square fashion. And then I have some normalizer or some, uh, some constant out front. And what this basically says is you really want to be on target so as many of your parts as are right close to the target, the lower your loss function is. And then the further away you get, the worse and worse things are. So this really drives you to do two things, right? To minimize quality loss function, what do you need to do? You want to target your process, get it mean-centered. And second, you want to reduce the deviation, reduce the variance in your process. So with one quality loss function, you're really driving the process towards, towards both goals. Now, there are questions about, you know, how do you calibrate this? Um, and there's some rules of thumb, for example, if people take in upper and lower uh, spec limits, you can start to sort of relate these to, um, you know, some, some cost associated with if a part actually goes out of spec and either you shipped it or not, you know, what is the cost of throwing away that part? That might give you a point on the curve and establish an actual dollar value, for example, right at those spec limits. But it actually isn't that important what the, what the, what the number, number is. It's really that you've got this quadratic dependence which drives you uh, towards uh, minimizing both uh, uh, being off target and the variance. So here's an example on the use of tolerances and now pulling in both our distributions and control charts. So here we're assuming the process is normal. And what I've done here is drawn first off our in control process with its uh, mean and its plus minus three sigma points. Now notice here I've superimposed x star, so this is the desired target, and notice we're off target a little bit, right? There's a deviation between where our process mean really sits and our target. And I've also drawn these spec limits, okay? So now you can start to evaluate various questions like, well, what's the probability, not of a false alarm, but the probability of a non-conforming part, right? And that's easy. You, you're just looking at the tails. Ah. So I can actually go in and say, okay, the probability of a non-conforming part up on this side is just that tail to the right based on the actual performance I need. You can also start to ask questions of, well, what's the, um, how does my probability of getting non-conforming parts change as a function of how far off target I am, right? And that's just shifting the thing and it's moving those tails around. So you can evaluate both of these. And essentially, a, a very nice canonical way of talking about how, uh, far apart your spec limits are compared to your distribution, how good your underlying process is compared to your spec limits, is this notion of process capability, or CP, and then CPK, as we'll see in a minute, also pulls in the idea of, of the mean difference. So first off, definition of CP, or process capability ratio, is simply the distance between your upper and spec limits and six sigma of your underlying process. Now you start to hear, you know, the six sigma uh, kinds of terminology. 
chips, for example, with the score structure at the end, and you have thousands of parameters, um, each of which has a, has a spec. So what's, I mean, what's the, the quality loss function? Each of them is, you know, with, at, at some point, and typically you just look at all of them if something is, you know, way out, then you're worried, but right. otherwise you're not really. So you're asking really, I think, two questions. I'll give you a really quick answer right now, and then we'll we'll defer some of some of those. So your first question is, uh, for example, in semiconductor manufacturing or in many processes, you have multiple process steps, and what you can often do is have control charts for each individual one of those. You can talk about the process capability of each one of those, and yes, indeed, there is also very often the question about sort of quality roll-up of how quality loss or uh, deviations either add up or compound themselves across multiple steps. Um, so we'll talk about that, but the first quick answer there is if each of those process steps are independent, then it's, it's simply an additive function. Where it gets interesting is if those two process steps are not independent. So for example, the second process step may magnify or shrink or in fact even be designed to compensate for deviations in the first process step, in which case there is intentional correlation between the two. So it's not always a trivial question of how multiple steps interact to aggregate. The second question is a little different, which is, especially in today's highly instrumented processes, there are a zillion parameters that you can measure. There's a zillion control charts. And what we've been talking about so far is a single parameter control chart. And there's some very important corrections one has to make when you've got many, many control charts or many, many parameters. And just to give you the intuition, if the probability for a single control chart with plus minus three sigma control limits, a, a false alarm is three out of a thousand, or an average run length of 333, and you have a thousand independent control charts, how often do you think you're going to see a false alarm? All the time. <laughs> right. So the quick answer there is you actually have to think about an aggregate false alarm rate, not an individual alpha on every chart. And you really should make an adjustment. Basically, spread your control limits on every one of your independent individual charts much wider so that you don't drive the engineer nuts chasing false alarms. So we'll, uh, I think, talk about multivariate situations also a little bit later. Very good questions. So the key idea here on the process capability is simply talking about the spread in your process compared to your spec limits and how good that is. Notice that if I'm off target, this definition, CP, doesn't change. This is purely talking about the inherent variance, the inherent spread in your process compared to your spec limits, your inherent Six Sigma spread compared to your spec limits. If you also want to worry about mean, and you often do, another measure is the CPK. And what that looks at is the shortest distance, either on the right or the left of the chart, between your spec limit and your mean. How many sigmas apart is your mean from one of the spec limits? And divide that by three sigma, three sigma on either side. Right? And so now you're penalized by, for, for being uh, offset from your target. Okay, so let's look at this graphically and get a little bit of a feel here. And here I'm just using tolerance limits. I'm not talking quality loss uh, at, at this point. CP, CPK are actually just defined for pure plus minus tolerance limits. So what's drawn here is a spec, set of spec limits that go, th these are sigma markings. So if I look at First off, CP and CPK, my lower spec limit, upper spec limit, those are six sigma apart compared to the variance of my underlying process. That's just a CP of one. 
So qualitatively, CP of 1, you should mesh in your mind, just says my spread is such that my plus minus 3 sigma tails are right at the spec limits, if I'm perfectly centered. Okay? And as pictured here, I am perfectly centered, so my CPK is also 1. In other words, my minimum distance between mu and my upper spec limit, or mu and my lower spec limit, is both 3 sigma. So the minimum of those two is still 1. So my CPK is 1. Okay. Now let's consider a slightly different picture. Here I have my spec limits different um, from my, uh, or basically my <coughs> x bar or x star here and my mu are very different. My process spread is exactly the same as before, right? I still have an upper spec limit minus lower spec limit equal to 6 sigma. So my CP, my, in some sense, my inherent capability of the process in terms of spread is, is still exactly the same. But now, because I'm off-centered, the distance from uh, mu to the lower spec limit is 0. So my CPK is 0 in this case. Right? So qualitatively, these are very different. Here's a, another situation. What's changed here? Now, in this case, my spread is much smaller. I've got a tighter distribution. And in fact, my upper spec limit to lower spec limit is basically 12 sigma. That's great, right? So that's a CP of 2. Now, I'm still off-centered. I'm mistargeted. And so in this case, my minimum distance from mean to the lower spec limit, that is the smallest distance. And that's still 3 sigma. So when I divide that distance there, I get the CPK of 1. Okay. And here's one last example. In this case, now I've recentered, got my CPK up to my full theoretical possible CP of 2 by putting it back on this back on the, on the target, putting my mean back on the target, okay? So when you're, one of the things you use these CPs and CPKs for is in manufacturing, and you also can use it in design to get a quick feel for the relationship between your manufacturing capability, the inherent spread and, and, and mean to target uh, centering, um, compared to your design spec. So you can characterize your CP and CPK and then evaluate, well, if I make some change in my design spec, what probabilities would that do? If I tightened up my spec limits, you can start to say, if you just even know just a CP and CPK, you can back out, that's all in terms of normalized standard deviations, you can back out probabilities associated with the number of parts that are not going to conform to those specifications. So if I purely tell you CP and CPK, you know probabilities, fractions of non-conforming parts. Okay? And then you can start to also compare how much would it buy me to move my mean, right, in terms of fraction of non-conforming parts. How much would it buy me, it may cost a lot of energy and time to move the mean a little bit closer to the center of my spec limits. Is it worth it or not? Or would my time be better spent shrinking my variance if I were looking for possible process improvements? You can start to make those, those comparisons. And the last thing I want to do with the CP and CPK is give you a little bit of a qualitative feel for these. Because what is a good value for CP and CPK? Well, the larger, the better, right? A CP or CPK of 0, that's not good. When you start getting in the ranges of two, that's often what is talked about in manufacturing as, as being a goal. But it really depends on your process and what the costs of non-conforming parts are. Right? But just to give you a feel, then, for these probabilities of, of non-conforming parts and what kind of CPs or CPKs those correspond to, just recognize that a, a CPK of 1 corresponds to three sigma tail right at the spec limit. And, and 
and, and being uh, three sigma tail off of whatever my mean is. So I might be off target, but three sigma out from the process mean, that's three sigma. Think of this as the number of sigmas, right? And that corresponds to about one in a thousand parts falling outside of our tail. Okay. In fact, you can ask it upper spec limit, lower spec limit. We actually know the number much more carefully. It's really, you know, three out of a thousand, uh, those probabilities. The if I go to a CPK of about 1.33, that corresponds roughly to a Z of four, four sigmas. I'm four sigmas uh, away from the spec limit. And you can see I get about 100x reduction in the number of non-conforming parts. If I can go another standard deviation or a CPK of about 1.67, I get another 100 factor of 100. And similarly, I get a, about another factor of 100 if I can get to a CPK of 2. CPK of 2 means my mean is 6 sigma away from uh, e either my uh, minimum distance or my upper or lower spec limit. And that's a very small number. That's really 6 sigma away, or about one part per billion, 10 to the minus 9. So why do you want something like a CP of 2 or a CPK of 2? Because one part per billion seems awfully small, right? And the, and the reason really is so that you are robust to small mean shifts. To get down to, even if you've got that, that small mistargeting, that you've still got enough room in an inherent process with, say, a CP of 2 or CPK of 2 um, to be able to uh, 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 have a very small number of, of non-conforming parts. So, whoops, what happened here? So here's, uh, you know, the picture where my CPK and CP are both 2, perfectly mean-centered. Again, that's the 6 sigma distance here between the tail. And we said uh, the probability of having way out here in the tail, and that's my, my, my PE, my uh, num fraction of non-conforming, and it's about one part per billion, maybe two parts per billion. But now, let's say that I actually have a mean shift, Oops, that was a little weird, uh, where I've actually shifted by two sigma. Okay? And recall we said, back with control charting, detecting small mean shifts of one or two sigma are actually kind of hard. You actually have to drive sample size way high to have uh, 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 a very rapid detection. And what we'd like to do in this case now, I've got still the same inherent variability or a CP of two, but that two sigma shift still leaves me four sigma before my tail uh, starts impinging very much on my on my spec limit. And so now I'm here at about 31 or 32 parts per million non-conforming. So that's kind of the drive towards uh, Six Sigma, is that it allows you to accommodate or have a process that is capable enough that it can accommodate both the variance and target deviations. Both of them are hard to maintain uh, you know, as, as small as possible. Now one can also go back and if you're given the quality loss function, you can also ask um, if you have the probability, so think of this as the PDF, if I have the probability distribution function, I've got my underlying process with some mean and variance. You can also do that integral and ask questions about what is my expected quality loss and do the same kinds of things for mean deviations or variance changes. You just have to go in and es essentially do the calculation. One thing that's nice is if you look at the expectation of that quality loss function and just go through and do a little bit of, 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 the, of the basic expectation math on that, right, where you split out, factor out x minus x bar, do that, do that squaring, and then um, um, relate components of the expansion. What you get is one component, 
that is clearly related to your variance in the process and another component that is clearly related to your mistargeting or deviation from the mean. So in one quality loss function, again, you can see and relate in the normal distribution sense how both variance and how um, uh, uh, target deviation uh, contribute to, to quality loss. Okay, so just to recap a little bit on the on process uh, capability, what you've got is some characterization, you've got a model of your real process, right? Where it's really operating, when in control, in the best situation, right? Um, you know it's mean, you know it's variance. You've got the requirements, the spec limits. You don't use the spec limits to set your control limits. Control limits are based on detection of unusual events, and that's based purely on your model. You might superimpose your spec limits to be able to quickly calculate and think about what the probability of non-conforming parts are, right? But th those, are, those are different things. To relate the two, a good way of thinking about it is the CP and CPK or a qu an expected loss function. What's nice about CP and CPK is we basically normalized away so that if I came up to you and, and told you, my process has a CP of 3 and a CPK of 2.5, you'd go, wow, I'm impressed, right? That's, that's a pretty good process, or awfully, awfully loose spec limits. <laughs> One of the two. You don't really know. If, if each step is a sigma, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but there is no, and, and let's say, uh, the real determinant of yield is tracking. I mean, you could have six sigma for everything, and you could still have zero yield because the tracking is not there. So is there like a CP and CPK of a tracking structure that we could well, the, I'm not quite sure what, what you mean by tracking. If by that you mean For example, let's being say, on target. Yeah, let's say yeah. Uh, length tracking between horizontal and vertical uh, ah, oh. lengths oh, okay. would be very important. And each step by itself would be six sigma. And, and if the tracking is off, the, both could be within that limit. But Yeah, so that's again another multivariate question, looking at how important it is for two parameters to be close to each other, even if one or the other could deviate. It's okay if they both. And, and so what I would do is, if the importance is the difference between those two dimensions, that's what I would characterize, and that's what I would chart, put a plot on, and that's what I would set my spec limits on. I might also still care about, say, channel length, and so I might have another chart on that, too. I have to be careful because they're not completely independent. But, but um, what you really want to do is, is get your, your statistical process control apparatus targeted at or applied to the things that are most critical to you. And so in your scenario, the tracking between those two parameters, that's what I would monitor. Okay. Um, so this is just a recap of the X-bar chart uh, with a little, ew, that's kind of ugly. A little example, I wonder if I can just get rid of all those, let me just try to go forward here. I think this is trying to reveal a data point one at a time, which we don't really want to do. So here's an example. Based on what you've seen about um, an X-bar chart, and assuming here we've really set plus minus three sigma control limits on this chart. If you were wandering, moving along, um, and just were triggering just on, say, extremal points, what do you think? Was this, was this an alarm? Well, sure. Uh, how about that one? That was an alarm. Do you think they were real? Was it a false alarm, a real alarm? Why do you think it was real? Well, so I expect to have more points later up 
So, so the real answer is we don't know. But you're doing exactly the right thing going back to some of the discussion we had earlier of looking for additional evidence. So your evidence here was saying, if I got this alarm, I might look back and say, well, the previous points, hmm, there's an awful lot of them to one side of the mean, and in fact, maybe a drift, although this point sort of looks like it's counter to the drift. So, so there's a little counter evidence. Um, by the time I get to this point, now I'm starting to get really convinced that uh, something, is, something is weird, right? Because now look at this. What's the probability of having all of those points? That, almost all, except for, for that one or two, to one side of, of, of the mean. Well, you could actually go and calculate that probability, right? Sounds like a problem set problem. Um, but, but qualitatively, you know something looks like it's off target. So this is the kind of kind of thinking that 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 you would want to do. Now, hmm, this is a little tricky. What do you, if you were just eyeballing it, what do you think a CP or a CPK would be for 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 this process? I have no idea. I haven't done the calculation. You could go and do the calculation, right? Based on what what would you do to actually formally try to calculate a CP or a CPK for this process? Yeah, you'd, you'd calculate the mean and the standard deviation. First off, you have the, the true mean and you have the true uh, control limits. Could you calculate a CP or CPK based on mean and standard deviation? I give you those numbers. No, I think you need the upper and lower spec limits. You need spec limits. Control chart by itself never gives you spec limits. So you don't know. It may well be, I've got really tight spec limits. My parts really need to operate down in here. By the way, you also have to be careful because if these are based on n samples, the sample distribution is tighter than the underlying process distribution. So if you see spec limits also on your control chart, that's kind of a warning because usually a control chart is based on sampling. right? So, so by itself, you can't really know what your CP and CPK are. Okay. And, and I would be cautious about assuming your spec limits are anywhere near your control limits. Don't assume your spec limits are plus minus three sigma. You're, you're, you're really falling in the trap of, of sort of a, basically assuming a CP or a CPK of one process, which is not often the case. Absolutely. So, Why? Here, yeah. you're, you're having a huge so fraction very, of non-conforming. Yeah, so this would be, that's, why, that's my point. Your spec limits may be very tight and your process would be horrible. This is not a capable process. So normally, yes. What you w normally want to do is trigger on alarms much before you have parts that are falling outside of spec so that you can react to drifts in the process before they cause you disaster. Absolutely. That was implicit. I'm glad you made it explicit. Yes, yes. OK. So I think we've talked about a, a lot of these. What I'd like to do uh, is give you a little glimpse of some additional control chart ideas that are beyond the X-bar uh, S or X-bar range uh, chart. There's some very good things about the X-bar chart. It's relatively simple fairly transparent, meaning you sort of know what each data point means, you know what an alarm means. Um, it relates very closely to assumptions of normality, and in fact, by the act of sampling, you're enforcing some of these assumptions, right? By sampling with n larger than 1, generally, you've got the central limit theorem on your side, so x bar is really trends towards uh, a normal distribution. <clears throat> and, and we'll talk about this a little bit, if I've got long times between samples, if there's very, very short uh, correlation, short time scale correlation between sample points, these samples are truly independent measures of, of the process. So uh, as long as I've got reasonably long sampling times, um, each of my samples are an independent draw from 
from, from the process. The problems are, yes, sample size, I need n more than one. And very often, I may be measuring every one. So I'd like to get to some ideas or control charts that, that might be able to either react faster, a shorter average run length, or be able to utilize the fact that you've got more data and I can have this, this faster time response. So, in fact, let's think of real briefly about the limit. What if your sample size is just one? Could you go to that limit? There's a couple of tricky points here, right? Um, the good thing is you have a lot of data. I can look at every part and respond quickly. But now a lot of these assumptions on the statistics or the, the calculation of these basic statistics don't have meaning anymore. For a sample of size one, what is the average? Well, okay, it's just that value. What's the standard deviation? Uh, no, it's undefined. One over n minus one in the standard de that You don't have enough data. You have no estimate of, of, of variance from that sample size of one. So an approach here is essentially use kind of a variant uh, referred to as a, a running control chart or a running average. So you look back, not just on the new sample, but some number of previous data points and kind of have a window that moves along or, or some calculated average of past history where I might weight my most recent measurement either equally or more importantly than my past measurements and use that as an estimate for the process average and the process variance. Does okay. that violate the independent Absolutely. Assumption? It does violate the independent assumption. Um, if, however, they truly are independent, you can still formulate statistics and probabilities associated with that. In other words, if your, if your process data was independent, um, what you've got is from any one point in time, I can calculate the probabilities associated with that. But if I then calculated that for my next point in time using some of the same data, I would never use some of the WECO rules like the probability of two points in a row falling above because they're no longer independent. I can't just multiply those two, those two probabilities. So it would get really messy trying to calculate sequence probabilities um, uh, using a, an, a running average. Now that's different for, we'll see, this notion of a cumulative sum chart where actually you want to use the fact that there is dependence <coughs> to aggregate deviations and detect them even faster. So you, you use that very notion of lack of independence. So let's talk about these sort of running average or an n equals one kind of design. What you'd like to do is have increased sensitivity. You want to detect small changes, um, especially small delta changes. So small shifts are one class. There's also cases where you'd want to detect a small shift. We'll come to that chart in a, uh, a little bit later. You could also have uh, the desire to not have too many false alarms, so you still want noise rejection. And one of the problems with some of these are you might, in fact, actually have uh, higher, uh, higher variance estimators, and, and you've got to be very careful because you can get larger false alarm rates unless you compensate for that. But the basic idea, and this, this almost goes back to your, your earlier question, imagine first off what we're doing with just a regular X-bar chart, but where we're measuring every part and then just aggregating in samples of different size. So what I've got here is the run data, and then in the little purple pictures is an X-bar calculated for each group of four sample points. So every four, I calculate the average, then I move on to the next four and calculate the average. And so in a typical sort of X bar chart with sample size n equals four, where my sample time is also n equals four, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've got a smoother curve here with the X bar. And we didn't explicitly talk about it, but one of the advantages of the X bar chart what we talked about was the squeezing of the distribution down. Another way of looking at it is we're filtering high-frequency deviations down to try to detect 
a smoother average uh, that's more indicative of the true mean of the process. I'm really not trying to detect variances. I just as soon have one signal that just told me how good my mean is. And so an X bar really does filtering of your data. Okay? So if you think about it from the filtering perspective, what does the filtering do? It reduces some of these sharp peaks, right? Um, it aggregates or hides some of this intermediate data, reduces this high frequency content to try to get to the low frequency, either drift or a mean shift, a single mean shift that's applying to many data points together. And so you can also think about these as, as um, filtering operations. And anytime you've got filtering, you do get at some of these questions we were kind of asking about, about how related or how independent are samples at different points in time. So one can actually go in and have a measure of this independence. And if the process itself within a sample, are, the points are highly correlated, you actually have to explicitly think about this and for control charting, spread those data points out. Um, there is a, 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 an autocorrelation function, this RXX, as a function of the time separation or the number of sample points between them uh, that has this, this definition here. If you think about it in terms of the time for an autocorrelated function that is, a, in fact, a inherent in a linear first order system, the autocorrelation function drops off fairly rapidly from a zero time gap. So if I sample at this point in time and I go some time away, the similarity of those sample points decays away. If it were truly uncorrelated, any, each and every new data point is completely independent of the other. And the point is simply here that if you're sampling from some physical processes, there may be an inherent correlation that isn't the one you're trying to get at. You're trying to detect long-term trends and not detect very small, small shifts. And so you can play around with uh, the sample time compared to uh, the inherent correlation of the process. And all this is saying is you want to pick your sample time ultimately such that if I pick this sample here and then at my sample time uh, some point later, this underlying sort of short-term correlation uh, is not what I'm detecting. I'm detecting, again, a big, a, big mean, a big mean shift. So we've been talking about this. Again, what you're looking for here is maybe pulling your small sample out, using, in fact, some of the correlation there to be able to say what the best estimate of the mean is right at that point in time and then have uh, uncorrelated samples around that. Okay, well, what, I'm, what I think I'll do is uh, probably stop now. Um, I think I'll pick up next time, defer or, or wait a little bit on diving into the yield until maybe uh, mid-time Thursday, because I do want you to get a feel for these alternative charts. So the charts we'll talk about next time include a moving average chart, Essentially, you aggregate your data and use that to form estimates of local mean and variances. And then we'll look at other clever ways of using most more recent data and weight towards those. So we'll talk about an exponentially weighted moving average control chart and what that idea is. And then finally, we'll also give you a little bit of a feel for a cumulative sum chart where we aggregate deviations from the mean because we're really looking for was there a small change or is there a small drift going on in the process? And how do we increase the sensitivity to detect that small, small shift as rapidly as possible? So we'll talk about charts that are really meant to squeeze that average run length for detection down. So we'll see you on Thursday. Uh, and again, while you're working on today's problem set, if you want to feel good, take a glance as soon as it's released at next week's problem set. It will make you feel much better. <laughs>